if you follow the news closely, now we are in the year of 2024, know only that when we talk about the word democracy, now, here's someone interesting that once said, and again, Winston Churchill, now he, this is what he said before, in order to understanding this democratic system in America. He said, and I quote, that America, I've always done the right thing after trying all the mistakes and failures. And of course, this is not easy for any country. When it comes to the word democracy, or when we come to the value of the democratic system, it's not just about talk the talk, it's more importantly that we put the action behind the words. But again, looking at what's happening today, for example, the war in Ukraine that still continues, if you remember or to follow social media closely, the current president of Ukraine, Zelensky, that shared a rather uplifting or courageous message on social media. And the message was very simple, to unify the group and also to unify the people around the world in order to understand the value of democracy. Well, what about the progress? And what about this leader called Vladimir Putin at this moment? And he sent the message pretty clear, not only to Ukraine, but also to the international community that he is staying and also he's very much interested in staying for the bigger picture. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to invite our distinguished speaker, who is Dr. Alexander Moto. Dr. Moto is American historian, a political scientist. And also, he's a professor of uh, political science at Rucker University and a specialist on Ukraine, Russia, and the Soviet Union. Well, Dr. Motol, and welcome back to The Missing Piece. As always, it's a pleasure and thank you for inviting me. Dr. Motol, I want to get started. Again, we're in the year of 2024 and the whole world continue to pay attention to the war in Ukraine. Now, not too long ago that we talk about this before, Vladimir Putin, who is the leader in Russia today, is very much interested in continuing his presidency. And so that's why he sent out a strong message that he's very much interested in running for another presidential election. But meanwhile, a few days ago, we also heard there were few or should be uh, uh, bold challengers uh, to Vladimir Putin's presidential run. And simply because people in Russia, they're fed up with the war. And also, they no longer believe that Russian today is living in this, what we call, perfect condition under Vladimir Putin. Here's the first question. We know where scholars believe that those challengers might not even make it to the ballot. But why is it important for us to understand the existence of the challengers? And what does that say about the current political state in Russia? Very good question, thank you. Well, the key challenger is a man by the name of Boris Nadezhdin. Mm. Um, and he declared his interest about a month ago and is essentially following the script as permitted by the Russian constitution. So in order to run, he needs something like uh, 150,000 signatures. The number might be a little higher, but in any case, roughly that amount. Um, and so he's not breaking the law mm. um, and he appears to have reached that goal or is very close to reaching it this has raised all sorts of speculation about who he is uh, some people say he's really just a putin clone and that the reason he's running is to create the impression the false impression that the elections are democratic, that there is a serious opposition, and that Putin won fair and square, uh, playing by playing uh, according to the democratic rules. Uh, that's possible. Uh, it seems unlikely uh, because he's openly criticizing the war. Mm. He's openly criticizing Russia's participation. Um, if you look at his background over the last 20, 25 or so years, he's been involved in, with rather, you know, more or less democratic, more or less opposition groups. Uh, so he seems to have the credentials. Um, he's also somewhat of an imperialist. He <laughs> doesn't think Ukrainians exist. 
but one has to be grateful for anything one can get in the Russian context. Um, what suggests to me that he might be for real is the fact that he's, uh, he wanted to print a newspaper with his program and articles, and he finally found a publisher, but he was originally denied by something like 60 or 70 presses in Moscow itself. Again, that might be an elaborate game by the security services. Uh, it seems more likely that they were doing so on the orders of the central authorities mm. who are beginning to see that Nadezhin is somewhat of a possible threat. Um, and of course, in order to sign, uh, to provide one signature for his running, uh, there have been lines you know, established by Russians uh, again, who, you know, they're doing so because they know this is permitted. They're not violating any laws, so mm. one can't accuse them of anything. They are exercising their so-called democratic rights mm. in Putin's authoritarian Russia. Um, and so this is visible. It's visible to the people. And some, I mean, a number of analysts, I mean, well, including myself, I lean in the direction of thinking that he's for real. Mm. In any case, the important thing is that the people who are signing these petitions and who are going out and supporting the Nadezhdin, they think he's for real. Mm. So even if he's not quite real, maybe he is, in fact, working on behalf of the Kremlin. The fact of the matter is, is that a very significant number of Russians have gone out and actually... Uh, profess their support of an opposition candidate. Mm. That alone is very significant because it suggests that there is discontent, that people are tired of the war, that they are looking for alternatives. Maybe not everybody, but certainly a significant enough portion to go out on the limb and put their names on this document. Uh, again, technically that's not illegal, but you know, in Russia, <laughs> they are effectively declaring their opposition to the current regime. So there could be reprisals in the future. So this election is getting a little interesting. Mm. Um, about two months ago, uh, it was obvious that Putin was going to win with the landslide. And it's still obvious that he's likely to win with the landslide because the regime is not going to conduct fair and free elections. But things could get very interesting because now they have to be careful. Before, before Nadezhdin, Nadezhdin said he's running, Putin could have won with 90% and no one would have protested. But given the support that Nadezhdin has, uh, Putin can't win with 90. He has mm. to be careful. Mm. Um, if the number of people who are ostensibly voting for him seems too high to Russians, they could easily conclude that they need to speak out. Mm. It's possible. Uh, this happened in Ukraine in 2004 with the Orange Revolution, when the candidate Yanukovych uh, clearly manipulated the outcome and provoked this popular rebellion. Uh, several years ago, we saw the same thing in Belarus. Uh, where the incumbent president, Lukashenko, won, mm. even though it seemed clear to the population that he lost. And as you know, there were several months of hundreds and thousands of Belarusians coming out and demonstrating. So if the Ukrainians can do it and the Belarusians can do it, surely the Russians can too. Mm. So Putin is suddenly in, in somewhat of a complicated position. Um, you know, if the elections take place, he obviously needs to win, but he has to be careful about the victor size of the victory. Uh, if he bans Nadezhdin from running, and they could easily come up with some kind of pretext, that creates problems as well, mm. because people will see this as a direct assault. Mm. Um, and then there's the larger context which is very, very important to keep in mind. Uh, so the war, although the Russians have made some incremental gains territorially, 
they're losing something like a thousand soldiers a day mm. dead soldiers a day and it's not surprising that there have been increasing numbers of protests by women whose husbands brothers sons boyfriends are killed are being killed mm. and the women aren't protesting against the war they're simply saying it's time to bring them home that kind of thing mm. and just two days ago there was a small protest but a very significant protest organized by women in ne right near the kremlin mm. this is astounding they managed to get up to the kremlin in advance they invited something like 20 journalists including people from outside of russia mm. so they're smart they're not just protesting, they're creating a, an event that becomes a media event, mm. and word immediately gets out. Mm. Um, and of course, the police didn't know what to do. Mm. I mean, they closed down the demonstrations after a few minutes, but what do you do with 60-year-old, uh, 50, 40-year-old women? Do you beat them? Mm. If these were men, they'd beat them up, but they can't. It's complicated. Mm. So there's that. There is already some discontent. And then two weeks ago, there were massive, uh, there were massive demonstrations in Bashkortostan. Uh, and the Bashkirs are a Turkic people, and they were protesting against the arrest of a local activist. And they protested in two cities. In one of the cities, they actually managed to have something like 10,000 people who showed up. Mm. That's incredible. So you look at that plus a number of other incidents and you begin to appreciate that there is something going on in Russian society. And we know from history, we know from the experience of Russia, but also other countries, that when the situation in the society is unstable, mm. elections have a way of bringing together the discontent and creating opportunities for unrest, uh, manipulations, but anything becomes possible. Mm. Uh, I wouldn't have said this necessarily a few months ago because it looked like Putin would just go have the election, he'd win, mm. the flags would be waved and that would be it. Uh, but now it looks like this could be a very interesting moment. Uh, it doesn't have to be, but it could very easily become a significant moment in Russian contemporary history. Dr. Moltel, I agree with you 100%, because again, as we're looking at this political state in Russia, and again, I want to go back to uh, the issue on this presidential race. Now, scholars believe that the challenger to the incumbent that right now, there's no denying the whole election, it's under the tight control under Kremlin. But meanwhile, as you mentioned before, citizens came out and they signed the petition. And again, I believe deep down in those people, in the citizens of Russia, they are looking for revolution and they are looking for something that can completely, I guess the word, opened up their minds and opened up their world views and so that they can re-engage with the world. But ironically, Dr. Molto, I still want to press on with the question is, despite the fact that if, even though, let's say, the political state or the election, it's fully controlled or tightly controlled by Kremlin, how much effect do you think it's going to create, not just domestically, but also internationally? You know, again, because America, like today, we champion for the concept of democracy, and we believe that democracy is viable. It's not just a word. It's actually an action. It's deeds. So my question to you, Dr. Molto, is, so why is it important for Russia today to have someone, even more than a person, to challenge Vladimir Putin. What message does that send, not only to the domestic audience, but from this international scale, from this international level, what message does that send? Your thoughts? Well, I think the primary, there are two, two messages. Uh, one is that Russians some Russians, mm. many Russians, mm. I don't know how many, uh, the Russians do want to be heard, mm. 
they do want to participate and they do support democracy. Mm. Now, their understanding of democracy may be somewhat different from yours or mine. In supporting someone like this candidate, Nadezhdin, in coming out in Bashkortostan, they are clearly expressing their discontent with authoritarian rule, mm. with the Putin regime. That is very important because we often make the assumption that Russians are incapable of democracy, mm. uh, are hostile to democracy. And there's clearly something in Russian political culture that is hostile to democracy. That's true. But we also know from history, we also know from the Russian experience particularly, that there have been very many moments, the most recent ones being in 2011 and 12, and before that during perestroika in the 1980s, when hundreds of thousands of Russians came out and supported democracy. Mm. That's very important. That means that there is hope mm. for this country. Uh, establishing a democratic order may not be easy. It may not happen overnight, but it's possible. And that's very encouraging. I think it's encouraging for the world because we can, because Russia, for Russia to be a a good, non-disruptive neighbor, a, a player in the international system, but one that recognizes international law, international norms, and so on, it really has to be democratic, mm. or at least more or less democratic. So democracy, I think, is a guarantee of many things uh, in Russia and outside of Russia. At the same time, the fact, the second most important uh, consequence of this, you know, Nadezhdin's candidacy and the Russians' willingness to go out, it shows that the regime is not as strong as we think it is mm. or as they would like us to believe. Uh, it's striking, for instance, that yes, they closed down the women's demonstration but they didn't arrest any, not to my knowledge. I mean, mm. they may have detained one or two, but in the past they would have taken their clubs and beaten them up, but they didn't. Mm. They detained 20 or more journalists, but after a few hours, they let them go. In Bashkortostan, they demonstrated to thousands of people and basically very little happened. Now, mm. since then, there have been reprisals but the point is the reprisals came after the event. Mm. Um, and the lesson people, I think, have drawn as these little events multiply. I mean, the women have been protesting for a year and a half in various parts of Russia. Uh, and then small protests, but you put them all together and you realize that this is no longer a small event. It's significant, it be, it's actually societal. And it's, again, indicative of the fact that the regime is not as strong as it believes it is. And with the approaching elections, this is important, they can't be as violent or as coercive as they might want to be. Mm. Uh, Putin can't afford to have photographs of women with blood streaming down their faces because some policeman hit them over the head. He can't afford that. Mm. Um, neither can the regime. And he can't afford that partly because he knows that that would be bad publicity within the population. But also, and possibly more importantly, he knows that that would mobilize the opposition within the Russian political elite. Because there are many Russians within the political elite and the economic elite who don't think Putin is doing a good job, who think he's driving Russia into the grave. And they write, they're right, of course, but the point is they believe this. They're also quiet because they're not sure what they can or should not be saying at any particular point in time. But if these images were to appear, if Putin does poorly in the elections, I mean, he may still win, but if he doesn't win in the way that they would like him to, that would be a signal to many that perhaps this regime needs to be 
transformed. Perhaps it needs to be changed mm -hmm. entirely as opposed to just part, part ways. So on the one hand, right, these elections and Nadezhdin is showing that there is hope for the Russians, but there's also hope that the regime may break down. Mm. Perhaps not in March during the elections, uh, but it's not as strong as they would like us to believe. Mm. Dr. Moto, I want to keep on our conversation. Not too long ago, the NATO General Secretary paid a short visit to the U.S. Now, let's talk about the war in Ukraine. Now, during his visit to Washington, D.C., that when he was questioned regarding the war in Ukraine, and this is what he said during the press conference, and I quote, Supporting Ukraine is not charity. It is the benefit of our own investments, which means the whole for the whole world. Now, Dr. Moto, help us with a better understanding. The uh, general uh, secretary from the NATO that made such a strong, a strong statement but meanwhile, another piece of reality is more countries today are actually experiencing what we called supporting fatigue or war fatigue. So which means this war has been dragging so long and we don't know when it's going to end and we don't really know what's going to happen. And of course, on top of all that, both sides so far refuse to negotiate. And there's no country in no nation today is willing to be the mediator because the intensity of the war. So, Dr. Moto, the question to you is very simple is, do you think that the statement from NATO today can actually help with continuing the support to Ukraine? And also perhaps that one nation or maybe uh, some nations are willing to step out to be the uh, mediator for both countries so that we are going to see the end of the war. And also we are going to see the end of the suffering among the citizens on both sides. What do you say to that? Whether that statement will change minds, I don't know. But that argument that it's cheaper to defend yourself today by supporting Ukraine mm. then by then as opposed to waiting as opposed to trying to defend yourself from Russian imperialism and aggression a few years from now that is valid uh, at this point in time the world simply needs to provide Ukraine not with soldiers mm. but simply with ammunition and mm. weapons um, and the Ukrainians are doing the dying for the world. Mm. If Ukraine loses, and we're more, what we're more importantly, if Russia wins, then the threat to the world, not just in Europe, uh, but also in Central Asia, um, as well as Asia more generally, will be significantly greater than it is today. Mm. The number, the out, the financial outlays that these that that the world will have to make in order to meet the Russian threat will be significantly greater, and most importantly, very soon after a possible Ukrainian collapse, Russia will continue its aggressions. Um, candidates are the Baltic states, very possibly Moldova, very possibly. Uh, northern Kazakhstan, very possibly. Uh, now with the alliance that the Russians have signed with North Korea, uh, it could very well lead to a North Korean attack on South Korea. Um, in this kind of world, if the Ukrainians are, are defeated, the threat to the world will be significantly greater mm. and the response will need to be much more costly and it will also entail human lives. Mm. Right now, Ukrainians are dying for themselves, for their country, but also for the world. If they lose, the world will have to die for itself. Mm. And that's, I think, I think so in that sense, the NATO General Secretary was absolutely right. Um, one needs to appreciate that in the medium to long term, if Russia wins, it will pose an enormous threat to global stability. So that means that, yes, there is, of course, this support fatigue. Mm. 
because it's been close, well, it's almost two years, almost exactly two years. And there's a sense that the war may be going on for another few years. It's unclear what the con what the end game will be. It's unclear who will win or who will lose. Um, and shouldn't we therefore just negotiate some kind of quick end? Um, well, the problem is that, well, or rather the moral of this, of this story is that if you want to avoid a long war, mm. that means that you need to support Ukraine today. Mm. <laughs> it's a very simple moral. And you need to support it at the level that it was supported, and indeed more than it was supported in the past. Unfortunately, the Biden administration, uh, along with some of the allies, but especially the Americans over the last year and a half, yes, they've provided Ukraine with weapons, but it's always been too little, too late. Mm. Had they provided, had the world provided Ukraine with all the weapons that it needed a year ago, the war would have been over mm. because Ukraine would have won. And nowadays we talk of the stalemate on the front. Well, the stalemate is the direct product of the fact that the countries of the world failed to provide Ukraine with the weapons it needed when it needed it. Mm. We created the stalemate. It's not the Ukrainians mm. or the Russians. And if you want to end the stalemate, the solution is very simple. You either support the Russians to win which is disaster, mm. or you support the Ukrainians to win, which makes perfect sense and is significantly cheaper than waiting uh, to see what happens after the Russians win. Mm. Uh, so the solution here is obvious, uh, provide more assistance to Ukraine. Mm. That said, as you, well, as, as you correctly pointed out, there is the sense of fatigue um, in the United States, in Europe, and other parts of the world. Uh, but the fatigue, unfortunately, is self-defeating. Mm. Dr. Moto, I got two more questions before letting you go. Now, let's talk about America. As we mentioned in the intro today, the political state is standing at the crossroads when we talk about America. Not only we are looking at this presidential election, but also we're looking at, again, as you uh, pointed out, the attitude towards the war in Ukraine. Now, let's bring the elephant in the room uh, into our conversation, which is the former U.S. President Donald Trump. That Donald Trump once said that he could actually end the war within 24 hours, and also to another major media outlet, and this is he said, and I quote, Russia, it's a great power, but we can force Ukraine to negotiate. Now, Dr. Molto, ideally speaking, we'd love to put those words on a piece of paper and it looks great. But in reality, we know that probably not going to happen because it's just too difficult. But let's talk about this. So as we look at this U.S. presidential election and also look at the relationship between U.S. and Russia and U.S. and Ukraine, how worrying or how concerning it is the statement like what Donald Trump just said, he could actually end the war within 24 hours, and also he could possibly force Ukraine to negotiate. Like, what does that send to the world, and what does that say about the mentality in the U.S. today? Oh, good Lord, you know, you <laughs> you referred to him as the elephant in the room, and that is a, an extremely good comparison. That is exactly what he is. I mean, one might even say he's the rhinoceros in the room. Mm. Uh, but in any case, he's certainly that. Um, it's absurd to suggest that he could end the war in 24 hours. Mm. That's just crazy. Um, you know, and, and one has to be blunt about this. That's just crazy. Mm. Even, even if he could get the Ukrainians and the Russians to agree on something, uh, the war won't end simply because three people shake, shook their hands in some room. Uh, namely Putin, Trump, and Zelensky, uh, even then the war would continue and there'd be no guarantees that some kind of deal that was reached in 24 hours would stick, would hold. So this is just a sign of Trump's megalomania. Mm. Now, on the other hand, if he wants to coerce the Ukrainians, well, there is, that is possible. Mm. Um, but of course, in some ways, the Americans are already coercing the Ukrainians because they haven't extended the support that they promised to give. 
But if the United States were to cut all of its support tomorrow, uh, Ukraine would be reliant on its own forces mm. and on the support it would get from the Europeans, the Koreans, uh, other countries in the world. That would obviously reduce the Ukrainian war effort. Um, I don't think the Ukrainians would lose. I don't think they would give um, I know they wouldn't give up, but it would certainly make it virtually impossible for them to recapture the occupied territories. Mm. Uh, so certainly Trump could harm the Ukrainians. Uh, with that in the war, even under the, such circumstances, probably not. And he won't end the war. And this is where Trump, again, he just doesn't understand how complicated things are. Um, he just, and in fact, let me be blunt, he's ignorant. Mm. He's ignorant of the realities. The main problem isn't Ukraine. The main problem is Putin and the fact that Russia has officially, formally, constitutionally annexed all of the territories that it currently occupies, mm. including some territories that it doesn't. So Putin, even if he wanted to, couldn't simply say, oh, sure, take this back to the Ukrainians, he would have to change the Constitution because the Constitution has no provisions for returning or de-annexing territories. Mm. It has provisions for annexing territories, but not for the reverse. And, you know, even though Putin is a dictator, it would still require a lot of maneuvering, more than 24 hours for mm. the Russians to change their Constitution. Um, so even minor concessions, territorial concessions by Russia, would violate the Constitution. Mm. And what do you do in those circumstances? Well, you essentially you wait until Putin is removed, a democratic government comes into place, and then is willing to change the Constitution, engage in serious negotiations, and come up with a compromise. Mm. But Putin is unwilling to come up with a compromise. Mm. He insists that Ukrainian leadership has to be removed. He insists that Ukraine has to be demilitarized. And he insists that all of the territories that Russia has occupied must remain in Russia's hands. Mm. There is no room for compromise. Mm. There is absolutely no room for compromise. And to imagine that Trump, who doesn't know this, would go into a room with Zelensky and Putin and come up with some kind of deal is just silly. Mm. Dr. Moto, I want but to ask you... Go ahead. I'm sorry, but unfortunately, that silliness is indicative of the silliness of American politics today. It is indeed. Dr. Moto, I want to ask you the last question. Now, when we talk about Russia, the last country that I really want to talk about briefly, it's North Korea. I mean, again, there's no secret that North Korea and Russia today are forming better relationship, which not only can terrify the neighboring countries, but also it poses a major threat to the West. So I want to hear your final thoughts as we look ahead of the war and also look at this presidential race, uh, race uh, in US and also in Russia. What does that mean when we see deepen or further cooperation militarily, politically speaking, between Russia and North Korea. How does that signify to the world today? Your final thoughts. Well, th two things. Um, on the good side, if there is such a thing in this particular case, it signifies, it shows how desperate and how weak Russia has become. Mm. Um, because... Russia claims to be a great power. It claims to be a superpower with a hegemonic role. And then essentially Putin goes to Pyongyang with hat in hand and begs for weapons and begs for assistance. Um, that's not what superpowers do. Um, it's like, uh, you know, it's like having the IMF or the World Bank 
go to some local credit union for money mm. as opposed to going to a big superpower like the US or China or some other place mm. for money. So it's indicative of the desperate condition that Russia is currently in. On the other hand, obviously, these North Koreans have already supplied Russia with missiles. They've supplied them with rockets. And these are being used in Ukraine. Mm. Now, will they make a difference in terms of the outcome? I don't know. But they are killing people. Mm. And at the same time, the danger for the world, but especially for East Asia, is the fact that the Russians appear to be providing the North Koreans with advanced technology, which they can use in their own missiles. That, of course, is an immediate threat to the stability of the region, and most importantly, of course, to South Korea. Um, if North Korea had a rational leadership with whom one could talk, that might not matter so much. Mm. But the current re leader, Mr. Kim, is arguably crazy. Mm. Is that a diplomatic term? Of course it's not. But the point is he is, let's just put it mildly and say he's a very complicated individual mm. uh, with a sense of his own grandeur and with a sense of destiny. And if anyone could start a war in that part of the world, it's he, it's him, mm. um, more than anybody else. He seems to be capable of that kind of activity. And one doesn't even want to think about what a war between North and South Korea would entail. Uh, Seoul is very close to the border. There are some 20 million people living in the area. Uh, if North Korea attacks, I mean, the consequences for South Korea would be devastating. Mm. And it would also, of course, involve American intervention. China would probably get involved in some fashion. Uh, it's just a nightmare scenario. Uh, but Putin doesn't care because North Korea is far away, and what he wants is weapons. Mm. You're right, Dr. Molto. I mean, again, as we look at the war in Ukraine and also understand this political state in Russia, I guess the end of the day, we have to say it's just need to be careful. You know, again, it's today, it's not to use the, this political power to satisfy it, one person's ambition or one country's ambition. It's really to, uh, it's a calling for this joint effort to stop the war and stop the conflict. I mean, we understand there could be disagreement, there could be struggles, but still there's no way that we're going to see more people continue to suffer for any other reasons. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to speak to Dr. Alexander Molto. Again, Dr. Molto, it's American historian. It's a political scientist. He is a professor of political science at Rutgers University and a specialist on Ukraine, Russia, and the Soviet Union. Well, Dr. Molto, thank you so much for your time. It's always been a pleasure speaking to you. I would love to have you back on the show as we continue to pay attention to the war in Ukraine and also the matters around the world. So thank you so much for doing this.